Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snatus, where medicine makes perfect sense, continuing our physiology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about genomic versus non-genomic action, or how the hormones work on a molecular level. And we talked about the famous anterior pituitary, and we learned that it secretes TSH, ACTH, GH, which is the growth hormone, FSH, LH, and do not forget prolactin. Just remember that in order to grow, you need growth hormone and you need the middleman, somatomedin C, which is insulin-like growth factor 1. Growth hormone comes from the anterior pituitary, IGF-1, the middleman, comes from the liver. Now let's get started. Please watch the videos in this physiology playlist in order. Recall that we have a CEO, and then underneath we have the general manager, underneath we have the employees. Similarly, here's the hypothalamus, followed by the pituitary, and then the employees that listen to the pituitary are thyroid, adrenal cortex, and gonads. The glands that do not care about the pituitary are the parathyroid, adrenal medulla, and endocrine pancreas. And we talked about the fact that these hormones tend to be slower because they are more likely to be fat soluble. However, the independent contractors tend to have faster actions because they have water soluble hormones. All of this was discussed before. Remember embryology? Yeah, do you remember my trilaminar embryo? Endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm? Where did the anterior pituitary come from? Answer, ectoderm. How about the posterior pituitary? Answer, also ectoderm, but different kind of ectoderm. Recall that the ectoderm is made of surface ectoderm for the epidermis of your skin on the outside and neuroectoderm, which is the nervous system. Now let me ask you a question. Which part of the pituitary is neuro, i.e. the neurohypophysis? Answer, it's the posterior pituitary. And that's why the posterior pituitary comes from the neuroectoderm. However, the anterior pituitary comes from the surface ectoderm. Surface ectoderm is for the epidermis of your skin and other organs such as the epithelium of the mouth, that's important, and the oral cavity, also important, and the neuroectoderm, which is the nervous system. Recall that the anterior pituitary secrete these hormones. The posterior pituitary does not make anything. It borrowed two hormones from the hypothalamus, and these are ADH and oxytocin. Hey, medicosis, why these are unique? Why these came from the hypothalamus? Why not from the anterior pituitary like the rest of them? Because they had to come from the hypothalamus since they are related to memory function. So they gotta be closer to memory organs and memory centers. Example, ADH increases after I lose blood in a car accident. Do you think I should learn from my mistake and remember this in the future so that I stop being so distracted while crossing the road? Yeah, that's why ADH had to come from the hypothalamus. Also, oxytocin had to come from the hypothalamus because it's important for memory. It's important that the female human forgets the pain of childbearing and the pain of labor in order to be pregnant again to continue the population. Note that the population replacement rate should be about 2.1 children per woman for humanity to break even without population growth or population decline. The anterior pituitary is glandular, we call it adenohypophysis. It secreted its own secretion. However, the posterior pituitary is not an actual gland. It did not synthesize ADH. It did not make oxytocin. It borrowed them from the hypothalamus. Okay, medicosis, but how did ADH and oxytocin make their way from the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary via neurons? Put differently, the connection between hypothalamus and anterior pituitary is bloody, but the contact between hypothalamus and posterior pituitary is nervous. That's why the anterior pituitary is known as adenohypophysis, but the posterior is called neurohypophysis. Okay, medicosis, I got you. But why hypothalamohypophysial portal circulation? What does the word portal mean? A portal system is any system consisting of two capillary beds in series. Here's the first bed, here's the second bed of capillary. And between them there is a door, there is a channel, there is a shunt. Door is la porte, porta, portal system. Medicosis is so multilingual, it's unbelievable. 
So before this blood can reach the heart, it needs to go to la porte and then to the second capillary bed. That's why it's called portal system. And then this door will let you to go back to the heart. Okay, medicosis, do I have many portal systems in the body? Well, you have some. The kidney is one example. The liver is the most important example. And don't forget my anterior pituitary, hypothalamus from the hypothalamus, hypophyseal to the pituitary. And between them, there is a door, there is a shunt, there is a channel, there is a path, portal circulation. Please recall that a collection of cell bodies or somas in the CNS is called the nucleus. When the same collection happens in the peripheral nervous system, it's called a ganglion. A collection of axons in the CNS is a tract. In the PNS, it's a nerve. Note that the connection between my hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary was done by means of axons. That's why it's called hypothalamus hypophyseal tract. Oh. There you go. Here is your tract, a collection of axons in the central nervous system. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Where did the anterior pituitary come from? Surface ectoderm. Where did the posterior pituitary come from? Neuroectoderm. Okay, medicosis, uh, which part of the surface ectoderm are we talking about? Remember that the surface ectoderm was responsible for the mouth and the oral cavity, right? So therefore, the adenohypophysis basically is an extension from your future mouth, the stomodium. What does the word stoma mean? Mouth. Let's go back to your science classes. Do you remember this leaf? Yeah, it had pores in it. What was the name of the pores? Stomata. Teeny tiny mouths. Holes in the leaf. But of course, your science teacher did not tell you that. That's why he's just a teacher, not a YouTube persona. Sorry, I take it back. Here is my anterior pituitary. It came from the stomodium, the roof of the stomodium, via the Rathke's pouch, which will go upwards. Okay, that's my future anterior pituitary from the roof of the stomodium. Okay, we got it. How about the posterior pituitary? Well, it's part of the diencephalon going down in an infundibulum. So anterior pituitary is here, posterior pituitary is here. The next step is that both of them will hug and kiss each other, fuse together, so that you have one pituitary gland under your hypothalamus, because your hypothalamus is part of the diencephalon. <gasps> it makes sense! Of course it does. Here is my lovely anterior pituitary secreting growth hormone, LH and FSH, TSH, ACTH, and prolactin. How do we influence the anterior pituitary via releasing and inhibiting factors coming from the hypothalamus? If you want the pituitary to make more growth hormone, hypothalamus will secrete growth hormone releasing hormone or releasing peptide. If you want to secrete less growth hormone, give me the famous universal inhibitor, somatostatin. Somatostatin is the same doofus that we talked about in GI physiology. It inhibits everything, and here is no exception. It also inhibits growth hormone secretion. After growth hormone is released from the anterior pituitary, what will it do? It will go to the liver and will talk the liver into making the middleman, somato, because this is somatotropin, meden, mediary. Like a bunch of lawyers going to mediation, trying to settle it between one another. Keep it in the neighborhood. Okay, medicosis, why do we call the growth hormone somatotropin? IN because it's a protein or peptide related. Trope or tropo means to grow something, trophic. Okay, and somato means soma, body. Oh, it makes my body grow. Exactly. Remember the body of the neuron? Oh, it was called a soma. Yeah, soma is the body. How about the middleman? Somato, body, meden, intermediate. Look at the beautiful colors. The red cells are the acidophils. The blue cells are the basophils. Both of them are inside the anterior pituitary. Look at that. Here's my anterior pituitary gland. Some of the cells are colorful, called chromophils, color-loving cells. Others do not have any colors because they do not have any secretions, and they are called chromophobes. They shy from color. Back to chromophils. They are larger. They have granular cytoplasm because these are the secretory granules, 
and they secrete their secretions that were stored in the secretory granules. Oh, it makes sense. Acidophils appear pink. We call them acidophils because they are acidophilic and they include the cells that make growth hormone. If growth hormone is called somatotropin, what do I name the cell that makes growth hormone somatotrophs? Okay, how about the next cell that makes prolactin? It's also an acidophil and we'll call it lactotrophs for lactation or mammotrophs because prolactin acts on the mammary glands. It will grow the mammary glands and will help make and secrete the milk. As for the remainder of the cells in the anterior pituitary, they are the basophils and they include thyrotrophs for thyrotropin, corticotrophs for corticotropin, gonadotrophs for gonadotropins. Let's grow your thyroid gland, let's grow your cortex of your adrenal gland, and let's talk to your gonads. The story of growth hormone and the middleman. Hypothalamus will release growth hormone releasing peptide or releasing hormone, which will go to the anterior pituitary and will tell the pituitary to release growth hormone, which will help you grow by means of its middleman going to the liver and telling the liver to secrete somatomedin C, also known as insulin-like growth factor number one, because it acts like insulin. From my previous endocrine videos, you recall that we have two tails of hormones, the lipid soluble and the water soluble. The lipid soluble cannot cruise in the blood because the blood is watery and the lipid is fatty. So we have to carry it around on top of a plasma protein. And since it is carried on the shoulder of the plasma protein, it will take a long time before it reaches the cell membrane. Once it reaches the cell membrane, however, it can diffuse through the membrane. It does not need any help from anyone else because your cell membrane is lipid by layer and this is a lipid hormone. It will cruise through the membrane like a sharp knife in warm butter, but it takes some time. Conversely, if you are a water-soluble hormone, no need for plasma proteins because you are water and the plasma is water, so you can swim in the water no problem. And you will reach the cell surface very quickly. However, once you reach, you will realize that you are watery, but the cell membrane is fatty and water cannot diffuse in fat, so you will wait until you find your receptor. Once you bind the receptor, you will flip the switch on and boom, the switch will talk to the nucleus by means of another middleman, the second messenger system, such as the G protein, which we talked about before. That's why I told you to watch the playlist in order. Growth hormone and prolactin have many similarities. Both are polypeptides, i.e. water soluble. Okay, that's why we say somatotropin, prolactin. If it ends in IN, it's probably protein or protein related polypeptide, peptide, etc. Both are secreted by acidophils from the anterior pituitary, and these are the somatotrophs and the lactotrophs, respectively. Both hormones will utilize not the G protein, but the JAK-STAT pathway. And believe it or not, both hormones are pro-lactation. Wait a second, medicosis, I get that prolactin is pro-lactation, but is growth hormone pro-lactation too? Yeah, that's why some farmers give growth hormone to dairy cows to secrete more milk. Oh, that's why it's important to understand that both of them not only are structurally similar, they're also anatomically similar and histologically similar. And the cells are in close proximity to each other. So it's not shocking to imagine the growth hormone sneaking and fooling the prolactin receptor and bind to the prolactin receptor to make more milk. Both growth hormone and prolactin will utilize the JAK-STAT pathway. This is an example of non-receptor tyrosine kinase. Just like receptor tyrosine kinase, however, it does not utilize tyrosine kinase. If you want to understand what tyrosine kinase is, I have a specific video titled Receptor Tyrosine Kinase and another video titled Non-Receptor Tyrosine Kinase. Again, the growth hormone and prolactin utilize the JAK-STAT pathway. However, this JAK-STAT pathway is not peculiar to growth hormone and prolactin. It's also utilized by hematopoietic cytokines and immunomodulating cytokines. Okay, medicosis, how can I remember that all of these utilize JAK-STAT pathway? Well, think of a baby growing. If I'm growing, I need growth hormone. If I'm growing, I need breastfeeding. If I'm growing, I need to grow my red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. 
Oh, and I need to fight infections. Ooh. This is the story of non-receptor tyrosine kinase. Again, it had its own video, but let's review it quickly. Here's the growth hormone binding the receptor. The receptor is made of two parts, as you see here, a monomer and another monomer. When growth hormone binds, it flips the switch on, which means Jack is active by means of phosphorylation. When Jack is active, Jack will activate STAT by means of phosphorylation. When STAT is active, it will talk to the nucleus to do whatever you want. Hey, growth hormone, what do you want? I want to grow. What do you want? I want protein anabolism. We'll do that for you because I have the machine. I have the DNA, I have the RNA, transcription, translation, protein synthesis, I have everything. I will make some proteins for you to help you grow. What else do you want? Well, I want to increase glucose in the blood. I can help you with that. I also want to raise free fatty acids in the blood. We will help you that and this will be a story in biochemistry. Growth hormone binding to the receptor. When it binds, the monomers become closer to each other and they dimerize. They become a dimer. Instead of two separate monomers, they combine together forming one dimer. And then before you know it, Jack is active. When Jack is active, it will activate uh, STAT by means of phosphorylation. When STAT is active, it will go through the pore of the nucleus, into the nucleus, and tell your DNA, hey, it's time for transcription which means to make RNA. And after transcription, it's time for translation, which is protein synthesis. What kind of protein? Depending on what growth hormone wants. For example, Mr. Growth Hormone wants to raise the glucose in the blood. That's why growth hormone will favor glycogen lysis, but it will not favor glycogen synthesis. And remember in biochemistry that glycogen lysis had many steps, which had many enzymes. Each of these enzymes are proteins. Who made them? The nucleus. The nucleus made them to please growth hormone. That's just beautiful. Remember before that you need to divide endocrinology into two lands. Insulin land and everything else is in the anti-insulin land because insulin alone is anabolic. How about the others? Catabolic. What do you mean by the others? The other team include glucagon, epinephrine, norepinephrine, thyroxine, cortisol, human placenta lactogen, etc. And all of them are team catabolic. Hey, insulin, you are anabolic, right? What do you mean? I am anabolic on proteins, on glycogen and triglycerides. So I am a builder. I am anabolic. I'll turn the amino acids from teeny tiny stuff into big proteins. I am a builder. I will convert the small glucose into big glycogen because I am a builder. I will convert the small free fatty acids into big triglycerides because I am a builder. However, the others are glucagon, cortisol, epinephrine, thyroxine, and they are catabolic. So protein will become amino acids, and then the amino acids via gluconeogenesis can become glucose. The glycogen is broken down into glucose. The triglycerides are broken down into free fatty acids. Anytime you do this, you will secrete ketone bodies. Okay, medicosis. So I see insulin, I see glucagon, epinephrine, thyroxine, cortisol, but where is growth hormone? Growth hormone is unique. It's kind of weird. It took one item from insulin, which is protein anabolic, and took two items from the other team, glycogen catabolic and fat catabolic. That's why growth hormone will help you grow muscles, bones, etc. by means of its middleman, insulin-like growth factor, because it's anabolic, just like insulin. The same growth hormone is also catabolic and glycogen. It will help you break down glycogen into glucose, raising the level of glucose in your blood. Hashtag diabetogenic, because I'm anti-insulin in this manner. Moreover, growth hormone will also help you break fat. Oh, by breaking the fat, I increase free fatty acids in the blood, releasing ketone bodies in the process. That's why growth hormone is ketogenic. Medicine makes so much sense, if explained properly. Hey, growth hormone, it's time for you to rise and shine. First of all, let me tell you that I am somatotropin. I am a polypeptide hormone. I am secreted by somatotrophs. These are acidophils of the anterior pituitary. And when I get secreted, I am secreted in a pulsatile fashion in order to be stimulatory to perform the functions that I want. 
But if you infuse me to a patient continuously, not in a pulsatile manner, I will be an inhibitor of these functions, not a stimulator. Pulsatile stimulates, but continuous inhibits. And I am secreted especially when you are sleeping near the early morning hours. Okay, growth hormone, what do you do? Well, in some manner, I am pro-insulin. In other manners, I am anti-insulin. Let's start by the pro-insulin actions. To be honest, I deserve no credit as a growth hormone. Who deserves the credit then? My middleman, sumatomidin C, which is IGF-1, which was released by the liver. This famous IGF-1 will help you grow proteins, grow muscles, grow chondrocytes, which are cartilages, and bone, and increase the size of tissue and organ, a fact that will be extremely important when we study acromegaly. You'll find that patients with acromegaly have a big heart, big stomach, big colon, and uh, this makes them vulnerable to polyps and colon cancer. How about your anti-insulin actions? Well, I am pro-glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, so I raise glucose in the blood. This is the opposite of insulin, and that's why I am anti-insulin. I am diabetogenic while insulin is trying to fight diabetes. Moreover, I break down the fat into free fatty acids, releasing ketone bodies in the process. What are the ketone bodies? Acetone, acetoacetic acid, beta-hydroxybutyric acid. These are acids. And of course, making ketone bodies is the quintessential anti-insulin function. Because remember, insulin is the major anti-ketogenic hormone in the body. All the other team members, including growth hormone, are ketogenic, pro-ketosis. Don't forget that my growth hormone itself works via the JAK-STAT pathway. However, its middleman, somatomedin C, works by means of receptor tyrosine kinase and insulin receptor substrate. It's the RTK and the IRS. We'll talk about somatomedin C in more detail in the next video. Let me tell you something. Any hormone that raises sugar and free fatty acids in the blood will help you cope with stress because it's providing you with sources of energy, ready energy for your brain, especially glucose. That's why when a hormone raises glucose and free fatty acids in the blood, it's called a stress hormone, i.e. anti-stress hormone, i.e. it helps you cope with stress. Growth hormone actions. When I was young, before the union of the epiphysis with the diaphysis, when the cartilage was still growing and laying down bones, Growth hormone boosts intracartilaginous ossification, which converts the cartilage cells into bone cells by means of IGF-1. <gasps> so IGF-1 can come from the chondrocytes? Yeah. So now you know that the liver cells make IGF-1. Also, cartilage cells can make IGF-1 to convert the cartilage into bones. Moreover, when your young growth hormone increases the length and thickness of your bones, that's why you grow taller. However, after the union of epiphysis with the diaphysis, you cannot grow taller. You can only grow thicker. This is gigantism. This is acromegaly, when you have too much growth hormone, before the union and after the fusion, respectively. The effects of growth hormone on metabolism are pro-insulin in one manner and anti-insulin in two manners. Pause and review. With any hormone that we'll talk about in the series, please try to remind yourself, what are the actions of the hormone? And how do we regulate the hormone? If you can memorize this by practicing active recall, it will help you tremendously. Regulation of growth hormone. Here are the factors that raise the growth hormone, and these are the factors that suppress the growth hormone production. Number one, factors that make GH go up include growth hormone releasing hormone from the big boss, decrease glucose and free fatty acid. Think about it. If you're starving and your glucose and free fatty acids are low, this triggers growth hormone to go up to raise the glucose and free fatty acids in your blood. So starvation, is a factor that raises growth hormone. Sleep is a very important factor that increases growth hormone, especially in the early hours of the morning. Stress, big time, why? Because growth hormone is an anti-stress hormone. It helps you cope with stress by raising glucose and free fatty acid in the blood. Sex hormones, estrogen, can boost growth hormone because both of them want you to grow. Growth hormone wants to grow your muscles. Estrogen wants to grow 
something else. Growth hormone wants to build up proteins. So if you eat amino acids, especially arginine, this triggers growth hormone to work harder to build up those amino acids into big proteins in your muscles, in your bones, etc. Growth hormone is reduced by somatostatin, the universal inhibitor, which is also known as growth hormone inhibiting hormone, also from the hypothalamus. So now we know that somatostatin comes from the hypothalamus, from the pancreas, and from the upper part of small intestine. Here is a pathology link. All of these three sites that I just mentioned can suffer from a somatostatinoma. The pancreas is a classic site. Increase glucose and free fatty acids in the blood. Growth hormone wants to raise them. If they are already raised, why the flip should growth hormone bother? It should not. Old age, everything deteriorates with old age, and growth hormone is no exception. That's why, as you get older, you're not growing. You're the opposite. You're senescent. You're declining. Obesity decreases growth hormone. Obesity is not good for your muscles. Some hormones, especially somatostatin and to a certain extent cortisol, might inhibit growth hormone release. And if you are abusing growth hormone surreptitiously from outside, why do you think your body will bother making the natural growth hormone? It won't. Starvation boosts growth hormone release, especially protein depletion such as quash your core if it happens chronically. If it's just acutely, carbohydrate depletion also stimulates growth hormone release. So in patients with quash your core who are protein depleted, growth hormone is very high as a negative feedback. As you feed them protein, growth hormone will decrease back to normal. Here is the hormone, here is the receptor. This is physiology. Pathology can hit you here, causing one disease, or hit you here, causing another disease. This is the story of type 1 diabetes versus type 2 diabetes. This is the story of central diabetes insipidus versus nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Type 1 rickets versus type 2 rickets. Similarly, if I have no IGF-1, this is lacking, this is called Levi dwarfism, sometimes called Levi Lorrain dwarfism or short stature. But what if the problem is not in the ligand? What if the problem is in the receptor of growth hormone? This is called Laurent dwarfism. These two diseases have a genetic component. For example, Laurent is autosomal recessive, mostly seen in Ecuador, but it's not the only cause of short stature. It could be decreased IGF-1. It could be decreased growth hormone from the anterior pituitary or decreased growth hormone releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. So why is the boy short? It could be a problem in the hypothalamus, a problem in the anterior pituitary, a problem in the liver, or a problem in the receptor. Regardless, when this happens, Usually, there is proportional decrease in span and height. What's my height? It's from here to here, from your vertex to your heel. But what's the span? Well, you need to make your arms like this, left and right. The span is the measure of the length from here to here. In these patients, there is decrease in height and decrease in span proportionately. So they look fine. They are just short. So when the growth hormone is low, I am short. But when the growth hormone is high, I am tall. If the growth hormone was high before the fusion of the epiphysis, or I could grow thicker if the growth hormone increased after I grew up already, which means after the fusion. Now, there are some archaic terminologies in medicine. The difference between pituitary dwarfism and pituitary infantilism. Dwarfism is just short, but sexually fine. Maybe some delay in achieving puberty, but once I achieve it, I am absolutely fine. I can have babies, no problem whatsoever. Conversely, pituitary infantilism is a problem in growth hormone, so I am short, and a problem in gonadotropins, so I am have hypogonadism and usually cannot have babies. Short stature has many causes in pediatrics. That's a huge topic. Here, I'll just give you four causes. A growth hormone problem, a growth hormone and gonadotropin problem, a hypothyroidism congenitally, and achondroplasia. In the first one, I'm just short. In the second one, I am short and I cannot have babies. In the third one, I am short, I cannot have babies, 
and I have intellectual disability or low IQ. It's the story of type 1 versus type 2. Pause and review. All of that was hyposecretion of growth hormone. Now let's talk about hypersecretion. If hypersecretion happens before the fusion of the epiphysis, I'll get gigantism. I'll be a giant. But if it happened after the fusion of the epiphysis, I'll grow thicker, called acromegaly. Let's start with the giant, gigantism, overgrowth of all bones, proportional increase in span and height, overgrowth of soft tissue, so organomegaly, muscle hypertrophy, hyperglycemia, because remember that growth hormone is diabetogenic. It raises glucose in your blood. And usually this is from a tumor in the pituitary secreting too much growth hormone. But this tumor has other problems. It's going to press on the surrounding healthy cells, flattening them. So what happens to the cells that secrete FSH and LH? They are toast, delayed puberty. What happens to my thyrotrophs? They are toast, I get decreased TSH, which can affect my metabolism and brain development if this happens early enough. Decrease ACTH, the corticotrophs are toast, so I get decrease of the stress hormone cortisol. If the growth hormone increased happened after I already achieved my maximum height, I'll get acromegaly. I cannot grow taller, but I can grow thicker. Very thick, coarse, facial features. The jaw is extremely big. It outgrows your teeth and that's why there will be increased spacing between your teeth, a sign known as prognathism. The jaw becomes very prominent, facial features very thick and coarse. The hands grow thicker, the feet grow thicker. My vertebrae can grow thicker, causing kyphosis or a hunchback. That's why the archaic terminology in medicine, which is very inappropriate, was ape-like face, spade-like hands, and Notre Dame-like back. Of course, you should never say any of this in front of patients. I'm only mentioning them because they can help you make a correct diagnosis. Just like the other horrendous mnemonic about the fat, fertile, febrile, female in her 40s with 55 kids when we talked about cholecystitis. Extremely inappropriate, but can help you save lives. Of course, you know that we all need to treat patients with dignity. What else happens in acromegaly? Organomegaly, muscle, hypertrophy in the beginning, later atrophy, because they outgrow their blood supply and they outgrow their nerve supply. Obstructive sleep apnea, why? Growth of soft tissue here, making it more difficult for me to breathe. Big colon with many polyps that can increase the risk of cancer. When the soft tissue in my wrist grow disproportionately, it can impinge upon the median nerve, causing carpal tunnel syndrome. In my lower limbs, tarsal tunnel syndrome. Too much growth hormone, it's diabetogenic hyperglycemia. This glucose is high in the blood, eventually it will end up in the urine, glucosuria. Glucose is osmotically active. It will pull lots of water with it into the urine. Polyuria, polydipsia, as if I have diabetes. Don't forget that growth hormone and prolactin are similar. They mimic each other. I can get gynecomastia. And this could be caused by an adenoma in my pituitary pressing on other structure. If it presses on the gonadotropes, thyrotropes, corticotropes, it will lead to these symptoms. If it presses on the optic chiasm, it will give me bitemporal hemianopia. How can I treat a disease caused by hypersecretion? Well, you can either remove the tumor surgically or give medications to decrease growth hormone or at least decrease its binding to its receptor. How can I decrease growth hormone release? Octreotide. It's a somatostatin analog, which is a universal inhibitor. It inhibits everything. It inhibits growth hormone release. But even after the growth hormone is released, can you block its receptors? Yes. Pig vesomant, pegylated, anti, and somatotropin, pig vesomant. I am an antagonist to the receptor of the growth hormone. A pituitary adenoma is a tumor in the pituitary that usually secretes lots of stuff. Could be lots of prolactin, prolactinoma, lots of growth hormone, somatotropinoma, lots of thyrotropin, thyrotropinoma, etc. This can lead to hypersecretion of one hormone and hyposecretion of the others due to pressure atrophy. 
Eventually, if the tumor grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, it can destroy everything. When the entire pituitary is toast, it's called pan, extended or inclusive, hypo, low, pituitary function. After mastering physiology, it only makes sense to take care of pharmacology. Download my endocrine pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. It will teach you about the different types of insulin, diabetic ketoacidosis, and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome. As for kidney physiology, it's on my website too. If you want to learn about many diseases, check out my surgery high yields course and emergency medicine high yields course, also downloadable at medicosisperfectionalis.com. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. In the next video, we'll talk about somatomedin C. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.